Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, opportunity to study your word tonight. And as we do so, uh, we're asking that uh, as we open your word, that you would open our minds. Uh, we want to see Jesus. We want to find comfort and hope and strength in you and through you for the struggles that we face in the Christian journey. So bless us tonight as we take this time of study together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Pastor Jan, you're up. I would like to begin with by looking at 1 Peter um, 4, verse 12. It's not in the lesson, but I, I think it's a good one to look at. 1 Peter 4, 12. Peter writes, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. You know, sometimes we think that when we have a relationship with Christ, everything should go right. But the reality is that the devil um, does not want us, he, he does not want to give up easily on us when we've turned our life over to Jesus Christ. And so we will face bumps in the road. We will face challenges. Um, the devil will do, do everything he can to try to discourage us. So Peter reminds us, don't, you know, think it's strange. When something happens and life is not going all roses because he, um, the, you know, we, we can, we can, you know, know that we are going to, to experience those, those trials and those tribulations. So let's look at the first one. Who is the enemy and what does he try to do? First Peter 5 8. And of course, y'all know who the enemy is, right? Mm -hmm. Someone want to read that? I'll read it. Uh, 5 8. Mm -hmm. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Okay, so the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so, you know, when, when, we, when we take a stand for God, the devil doesn't give up easily. He, um, if he can't, you know, he, he will try to devour us, he'll try to discourage us, he'll try to do anything he can to get us sidetracked. But, you know, we don't have to give up. Um, there, God has many promises us um, for us to claim. Okay, what other problems can we expect? Matthew 10, 21 and 22. Now a brother will deliver a brother to death and a father his child. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake but he who endures to the end will be saved. All right, so we can expect sometimes even family problems when we make a decision for Jesus Christ. Fortunately, in this day and age, that doesn't happen as much, but sometimes it still happens. Some people are very resistant when we make that decision to follow Jesus and we make that decision to follow his word. What guarantee does God give us? And let's look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Before I, I go to that passage, can you explain what you were just saying about some of these challenges that we can expect even among family? Uh, do you have any examples of anything you could share? Well, I know that um, we have had people that we've studied with 
that um, the husband has been um, adamantly opposed to the wife coming to church, um, to, to, to our church, even though she was convicted that um, the seventh day was a Bible Sabbath. We have had other instances where uh, a spouse has um, made it very difficult for the family. He, the wife would try to have um, a blessing at the family meals and he would bang his fork on the table and do other things during that time. Um, you know, so opposition happens um, in many different forms. Um, one, one example is we have a friend who was born in Nineveh and he, when he decided to become a Christian, his family beat him up and left him for dead um, when he um, was baptized and joined the church. So, I mean, we may not have those kinds of extremes here in America, but we can sometimes meet opposition from families when we make a decision who was, to follow Jesus. Who was that that you spoke of that was born in Nineveh? Joe Kidder. Pastor Joe Kidder, I, I knew that's who it was. And, and um, just as kind of a little promo, uh, we want to invite you to be with us this coming Sabbath morning for our Sabbath school study at 9.30 because Pastor Joe Kidder, the one that she just spoke about, that was beat up by his family uh, when he grew up in Nineveh uh, in what is uh, part of present day Iraq. Um, you know, God has done some amazing things through him and he is now a pastor and um, uh, a seminary professor, and he's going to be teaching our Sabbath school uh, class this coming Sabbath. An amazing guy. And the amazing thing is, is um, later on, um, his family, um, his family um, accepted him back into the family, even though he'd become a Christian. And his cousin became a Christian, and other members of his family became Christians. And later on, his mother said to him, you know, um, because you are a Christian, you are alive today. Otherwise, you'd probably be dead because of all the fighting that's going on there. And many of the, of the young people his own age um, died um, when they joined the army or, you know, um, through all the fighting that's happened. So, you know, it was, it was providential. He went through a lot because he accepted Jesus as a savior. And most of the time here in the United States, we don't have that kind of opposition from our family where they'd beat us up. But um, it still happens around the world. Okay, what guarantee does God give us? First Corinthians 10.13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as in common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So isn't that an encouraging promise? God is faithful. He is going to provide a way for you to escape temptations, for you to remain faithful and loyal and true to him. What must we avoid when facing trials? 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and external weight of glory. Okay, so we don't lose heart. You know, we may face trials, we may face temptations, we may face difficulties, but we keep our eyes on Jesus. And when we fix our eyes on him, we know that he is with us and he will go he is going to give us strength and he's going to provide for us. 
We don't know how sometimes, but we can be confident that he will. And we can lean in on him during those times. So what is the source of victory? 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So Paul, you know, Paul had his thorn in the flesh too. He had, um, he had, we, we believe, you know, difficulty seeing. And he asked God to take his, his, um, his difficulty away. And he asked him three times and God said, no, you know, you need to just depend on me. And um, so we know God doesn't always take every trial away from us, but he gives us power. And when we realize our weakness and we stay connected to him, with him, we are strong um, in his strength and in his power and in his grace. So what is one of the weapons we can use in this Christian warfare? And we're going to look at Hebrews 4.12. And this is such a powerful passage. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So God's word is powerful. We can, we can claim God's promises. You know, I want to encourage you, you know, there's over 3,000 promises in the Bible. And I want to encourage you to, to um, mark those promises and claim them for your own. God is willing to do for us what he's promised. And so we can claim his promises. His word is strong. His word is powerful. And um, I like to, you know, claim those promises when I pray to God. Um, because I know that God loves to hear us, you know, depend on him and trust him in all circumstances. So number seven, what will help us win the battle? First Timothy 6, 11, and 12. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, Faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So, so you know, Paul's advice to us is that we flee temptation and we keep looking to God and we, we claim his righteousness. Um, we pursue him, and God will give us victory. And victory, you know, can be ours through Jesus Christ. You know, I just want to encourage you to keep claiming his promises. He will give us victory. So what other victorious weapon do we have? James 5.16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So prayer is, is another incredible key um, for that. And we can pray for each other. We can pray for, um, for our, ourselves and for our, our friends, our family. Um, we can pray for for um, many things, and, and God loves to hear us pray, you know, and it's not just praying requests, it's, it's praising God, it's thanking Him, it's, you know, 
um, it's confession, it's all of the above, you know, just spending time in his presence, um, growing in him, and and um, it's such a powerful, um, it, it's such a powerful thing that God wants to do in our lives. Um, Phil and I have experienced that um, in our journey, um, that there have been times where we've, we've had intercessory prayer for somebody and um that very that you know we we got up from our knees saying amen and the person we were praying for called us on the phone and um you know made a commitment for jesus christ i mean it's just amazing god will answer our prayers okay there there's some other powerful weapons that we have at our disposal as a christian and let's take a look at Ephesians 6, 11 to 18. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I need you to go up, please. Thank you. The wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Did you see all the weapons that we have at our disposal? We have truth and righteousness and the gospel of peace and faith and salvation and God's word and prayer. And we have a lot of weapons at our disposal to fight against the enemy. And most of all, we keep looking to Jesus because he's the one who gives us the strength to overcome and to be spirit-filled. So what, what is one of the promises to obtain victory? The secret to overcoming Satan. Let's take a look at James 4, 7. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay, so the first thing to do is what? Resist the devil. Submit to God. Before that. Submit to God. Submit to God. Then we resist the devil. And the most important thing is draw near to God. You know, we are safe in um, God's hands. Um, uh, there's a kid's song that, that we used to sing. It's, God is bigger than the devil, and the devil is bigger than me. When I'm living on God's side, we're majority. And, you know... <laughs> I, I like that. You know, we, we can't in our own strength resist the devil. But when we are united with, with God, with Christ, you know, we, we, are, we are more than a match. You know, God is more than a match for Satan. He's a defeated foe. He was defeated at the cross. Um, and so when we keep looking, drawing near to God, we have nothing to fear. Um, what certainty do those who love God have? Romans eight twenty eight. 
And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So God can take whatever disasters happen in our lives. And when we submit to him, he can bring good out of it. He can bring joy out of it. He can bring um, wholeness out of it. I like to tell people that there is no experience that is wasted in our lives. God can take whatever experience we have and he can use that for his glory. Um, some of you um, don't know m m much of my story, but I ha I've lost two brothers to cancer. Um, my dad died of a heart attack and my mother drowned. Um, mm. My nephew was killed in a car wreck. Um, I, you know, I went through a lot of devastating things and, you know, I, I would hang on to Jesus. I didn't understand why all of those things happened in my life, but, you know, I hung on to Jesus. And then, um, when we were in Georgia Cumberland conference, uh, living in Georgia, I lost my, my, um, my job as an associate pastor, and I was just devastated. And God opened the doors for me to do um, hospital chaplaincy at Erlanger Medical Center. And I was by the side of, you know, almost every day of people who, um, you know, fa family members who were losing their, their um, family member to some horrific situations, whether it was, you know, when I was on call, it, would, it could be stabbings, it could be, you know, gunshot wounds, it could be car accidents, you know, drownings, um, fire, you know, you name it, I saw it. And um, I was able to be present with those people. God did not waste those experiences, my losses, because I was able to be with them and to um, journey with them through their pain. And, um, you know, so, so I look at that and I said, God didn't even waste those experiences in my mm -hmm. life. He enabled me to walk with him during those times. And, you know, with my, my loss of job, I, even though I was devastated, God opened the doors for me to pastor again. And so, you know, I'm very grateful. I, I got experience in crisis ministry that I would have never gotten any other way. And so God doesn't waste any of those, those experiences that, you know, are hard for us. Um, he will use them. We, we may not see at the time how he will use them for his glory later on but he doesn't waste them. We can be confident of that. So what, the final question, what will be the reward for those who fight? Second Timothy 4, 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight and I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So, you know, when we, when we look at some of the struggles that we have to face in life, this is not, this is not the end. You know, we are going to we are going to be rewarded by God. And we can have that confidence that whatever we're going through, whatever trials, whatever tribulations come our way, whatever Satan throws in his paths, this is temporary. God is going to give us something far greater, far jo more joyful as we keep looking to him, as we keep you know, seeking that relationship with him. Pastor Phil, do you have anything to add? Or are there any questions? 
Well, I wanted to say this. Uh, you were talking earlier about, um, you know, some of the challenges you were, you were referring to uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Uh, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, and how even when the devil tries to throw us curveballs, um, you know, God has a way of, of working things out uh, for our good. And I think about, uh, you know, what we're dealing with right now with this uh, whole uh, global pandemic and how it's hitting us and how it's impacting our lives. And I'm wondering if uh, any of you tonight might have a testimony that you want to share if there's, um, you know, as you think about these past five months that we have been uh, in this global pandemic. And uh, maybe you want to share, um, you know, something that uh, the, the way that this passage of scripture has been fulfilled in your life, that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. So um, just want to open it up and give you an opportunity. If any of you have uh, something that you want to say or something you want to share, yeah, I've been struggling, but, you know, um, here's how God has grown me through this. So I just want to open it up. Well, this is Kim. Um, this pandemic has enabled me to be able to attend Bible study. Um, I think if we didn't have this with my work schedule, I'm not sure I would have been able to make this time work. Um, it's It really, the way it sort of fell into place for me was, I think, God stepping in. Wow. Hallelujah. Yeah. Anybody I agree. Else? That's the same with me, too. Yes, Michelle, I know you have mentioned uh, to me many times that um, this, this uh, uh, pandemic, as awful as it is, has uh, had some blessings for you. You know, it's been, it's been such a blessing. And it's like, cause I, with my job, I work, you know, kind of fast and furious and in the world. And, and I was, you know, being steered away, but, you know, I mean, trying to, as hard as I could, the devil was throwing me curveballs left and right all the time. And this, on a daily basis, it almost felt like, and it's like in a time that everything was going so crazy, the pandemic hit and everything stopped. And that, that interruption of life brought me the ability to attend the week, the nightly Zooms, attend these Bible studies and just to, you know, connect with the Simi Valley Adventist, you know, my Simi family here and also reconnect and grow my relationship more with, you know, with God, our Heavenly Father. And it's just been amazing. It's been really good. Hallelujah. Great. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything they want to share? How this, uh, you know, even through this this rough, tough stuff, um, and the uncertainties that we face, that that God is doing something amazing, and maybe how He's used this to get your attention. Yeah, that's what I would say, Phil. I'm just amazed at how the local churches in this area are coming together now. Um, in way, you know, it kind of, <laughs> I I can use myself as an example. It's really kind of unfortunate that it took something like this that that to to make us faithfully coming to church <laughs> you know um but for a lot of us this has kind of like taught us how we should be fellowshipping on a regular basis you know and it, it really is my prayer that when this pandemic passes and i really think it will um that that we continue on in this this type of fellowship because the Simi church alone it's just been amazing how much is going on so and and we owe it all to god obviously that that to to raise up this church um especially you and jan to just you know to have such a tight schedule and now wow the drive-in is back you know <laughs> wow Amen. Thank you for that, uh, for sharing that, Aaron. Anybody else? I just want you to, don't want you to uh, feel put on the spot, but if anybody has something they want to share, 
Um, you know, I, I, I tend to be a, a person that is structured and planned and um, I don't like surprises. And this pandemic was a huge surprise to me. And so uh, it, it kind of forced me uh, to rethink some things and to uh, just kind of trust in the Lord um, through these challenges. And I'm just going to tell you, you know, um, I can really identify with that person who said the most useless thing they ever bought in their life was a 2020 planner uh, because basically all my plans went out the window. And um, so, but I, I, I really believe that even, even through this challenge, uh, God is using us uh, perhaps to look at innovative, creative ways. I, I, I'm going to be very honest with you. You know, this commitment that, that Pastor Jan and I have made to, to study with you folks uh, since the middle of April. Um, this wouldn't have happened. This wouldn't have happened. Uh, not, not in this, uh, not in this kind of way and to this extent. And, uh, I, I'm just praising the Lord for how he has used this. Um, and for me to step back from this and to say, Hey, uh, listen, Phil, you're not in control. I am. And you may have all kinds of plans, but I'm, I'm the one who's in control. And, and even though I don't believe that the, uh, that, that God, uh, in any way orchestrated what's going on right now. Uh, God has stepped in and he says, wait a minute, devil, um, even though you're trying to do this, I uh, just want you to know that I am here to make good things come out of something that's really horrific. And uh, I believe he can, I believe he already has. And I know he has many more things uh, that, that he can and will do um, in the days and weeks and months ahead. So hallelujah, praise his name. Anybody else? Okay, um, I want to I want to end tonight with a story that um, actually Pastor Jan and I shared last night in the little prayer room that we were on uh, for the week of encouragement that the Southern California Conference did, and it was. Um, uh, something that happened to us yesterday after we came back from church and the live stream worship service that we did, um, uh, something happened that was, uh, was pretty uh, amazing and pretty phenomenal. I want to tell you that story uh, this evening um, so that um, you can kind of have an understanding uh, of some things. Um, this was back, uh, the story began back in um, actually in 1983. Uh, when I uh, finished uh, graduate school, I finished my master's degree. Uh, Pastor Jan did as well. And uh, we were sent to Rock Springs, Wyoming. Uh, uh, it's, it's, high, it's high desert, high mountain desert. And um, the, there aren't any trees there, uh, or very few trees, I should say. Um, you know, just sagebrush. Um, in fact, one of our church members told us that uh, when he was a teenager, he worked um, at Little America. Some of you may have heard of the Little America truck stop there on Interstate 80 uh, going through Southwest Wyoming. And he worked there when he was a teenager. And he said that one day he was pumping gas for a couple of ladies. They, they, they came, they pulled in there, the gas station, they got out, and he's pumping their gas. This was back in the days of full service gas stations. And he's pumping their gas. And one of the ladies, one of the little old ladies remarked to the other one, she says, you know, this is really pretty. She says, uh, this forest is going to be beautiful when all these trees grow up. Uh, speaking about the sagebrush, which uh, obviously that doesn't happen in Wyoming. And, um, uh, you know, the wind blows really hard, um, worse than it does here during a, uh, uh, during a Santa Ana wind. Uh, they say in Wyoming that snow doesn't, uh, doesn't melt, it wears out. Uh, they say it only snows once in Wyoming, it just blows from one end of the state to the other. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, it's just, just uh, that, that's where we were. And, and in many respects, people look at it as kind of the, uh, where, we were, where we were serving as kind of the armpit of the state. And, uh, and yet we came to, to discover that even people in the armpit need to be saved. When we uh, started our pastoral assignment there um, in uh, 1983, of course, even though Pastor Jan was uh, uh, educated, uh, for pastoral ministry in those days, uh, those early assignments did not uh, involve something for full-time paid ministry for her. 
Uh, and yet she always assisted me in ministry. She was always there. She had a, a job uh, outside, a job in a counseling center that she worked at. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, we were told that um, the Rocky Mountain Conference, the Seventh Day Adventist Church headquarters in Denver, was going to be sending an evangelist uh, to hold a series of meetings, of Bible, Bible study meetings, kind of like we're doing, we've been doing with you folks. And that that was going to start in uh, early April of 1984. And so I was excited about it. They were sending in a, a veteran uh, pastor who uh, was an evangelist, and he was going to be uh, uh, working to um, uh, working with us and holding this series of meetings. We uh, rented a room in the uh, local Holiday Inn, uh, a banquet room there, and. Um, in March of, of 1984, uh, we began advertising, and we were uh, having people call in and register, and we had a number of people register for this event, and we were quite excited that, uh, you know, we were going to have a good showing, because the church was very small. Um, there were probably only, uh, Jan, what would you say, maybe um, uh, 35 active members of the church uh, in those days? I was going to say 40, but... Yeah, maybe 35 to 40. It wasn't many. It was just very, very small uh, group that we have. And, and that was on a good Sabbath that we might have 35 to 40 people. It just was a real small group. And so we were looking forward to this opportunity to evangelize and, and do this. And uh, I remember that uh, in, in the pre-registration period, there was this lady that called up and, and she mentioned a name, that her name, and it was a name I'd never heard before. It was just kind of a, um, yeah. Not that it was strange, it was just not a, a familiar name to me. Um, and she registered for uh, her and her husband. Uh, their names were Dawn and Janice Yancheson. And so um, was looking forward to them attending the meetings. Well, the meeting started in April, and uh, Dawn and Janice didn't come. Uh, they never showed up and uh, didn't know what happened, but they just didn't show up to the meetings. Um, in fact, uh, there was more trouble than that. The evangelist uh, did the first two nights, and then he landed in the hospital and was physically unable to continue the meetings. And I remember sitting uh, there, I, I'm just a, you know, just a young pastor. I was in my mid twenties, and I remember being there at his bedside. And I said, I said, Pastor, what do, what, what do we what do we do here? And he says, Well, we have you have three choices. You can either shut down the meetings. You can call up the conference headquarters and ask them if they'll send somebody else, which he says, at this late stage of the game, I don't think that's going to happen. And he said, uh, who, can, who can come tomorrow night to continue? Or he says, you can continue the meetings yourself. And I gulped really hard. And I said, me do them? And he says, yes. And, you know, I prayed about it. And I said, okay, I'm going to finish these meetings. And with God's help, we did. And uh, the meetings finished, but Donna Janice never showed up at the meetings. But it was very interesting. When the meetings were over, uh, the first Sabbath in May, uh, one Sabbath, Donna and Janice, uh, we, of course, had never met them and didn't know who they were. Uh, they showed up in church. They showed up in our church one Sabbath morning. And uh, they introduced themselves. And of course, their name, you know, was very familiar to me. And I said, hey, you folks registered for this seminar and never did come. And they said, yeah, you know you know, some things got in our way and whatnot. And I said, well, we're glad to have you here. Can we uh, have an opportunity to connect with you? And so we arranged for a visit with uh, Don and Janice at their home. And at that point in time, uh, Pastor Jan was pregnant with our daughter, Elizabeth, uh, and was scheduled for, um, uh, Elizabeth was, uh, was due in, uh, in, late, um, uh, in late May. And so anyway, this was early May. And we went and visited Donna Janice, and, uh, but they made it abundantly clear to us that they had no intentions of ever becoming a part of um, uh, an organized uh, church. Uh, he was raised as a Roman Catholic. He had been an altar boy. Um, and, you know, he just kind of had uh, a bad taste in his mouth about religion, and there was no way he was going to become a part of any formal religion. And yet, uh, they, they told us that in their time of studying the Bible and reading God's Word, that they were convicted that the seventh day is the Sabbath. And that's why they came to show up uh, in our worship service on Sabbath morning. Well, Jan and I just decided we were never going to push Don and Janice. We were just going to become their friends. 
and, um, and, and make friends with them and, and let uh, the Holy Spirit do the rest in their lives. And so um, we just continue to, to, to have a friendship with, with Don and Janice. Um, they continue to come to church. Uh, they were there for us when our daughter Elizabeth was born a few weeks later. And um, uh, we just, you know, developed a great relationship with Don and Janice. Uh, even the end of June, uh, they went with us. They joined us for our church camp out. We had a, a church camp out uh, up in the uh, Wind River Range uh, of, the, um, of the Rocky Mountains uh, there north of Rock Springs. Beautiful, gorgeous place. And uh, so we invited uh, uh, them, uh, and, and they came. They came to uh, our camp out. We had a wonderful time. And then after that, Pastor Jan and I went on vacation. And um, we were gone for a couple of weeks through the middle of July. And when we came back, uh, we went to church, and Donna and Janice didn't come to church. And they didn't come the following week. And they didn't come the week after that. And we began to wonder. And, you know, we called. We left them messages. They never responded to us. We left them voicemail messages. And of course, this was back in the mid, uh, early 1980s before modern means of technology. So you couldn't email or text message. You just left uh, voicemail messages on their home answering machine. And uh, uh, the days and the weeks went by. And finally, it's uh, the month of September. And I was at the hospital doing some visitation, the county hospital there. And I was doing some visitation. And I looked through the little card file. And I discovered in the card file under Seventh Day Adventist, it showed uh, anybody who was in the hospital registered as a member of the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And it had Janice's name. And I'm thinking, whoa. Why is she registered as Seventh-day Adventist? Because she's not a part of our church, and we haven't seen her in church. I didn't even know she was in the hospital. So Jan and I went to visit her there, and uh, Dawn was there, and we said, hey, man, we miss seeing you folks. And, and uh, yeah, you know, just got busy and whatnot, and, well, we sure hope to see you again. And, and while they were nice to us, they just kind of seemed a little bit distant, and we wondered what that was about. And um, after she got out of the hospital, she was in recovery time and whatnot, but we didn't see them the rest of the month of September. All of the month of October, we didn't see them. Through November, uh, through mid-November, we did not see them. They never were in touch with us. They didn't come to church. And it was the Sunday night before Thanksgiving. And I still remember that it vividly in my mind. This would have been the Sunday night before Thanksgiving, 1984. And... Um, I told Pastor Jan, I said, you know, we, her and I got to talking about it. I said, man, you know, whatever happened to Don and Janice? And so right there, um, we began intercessory prayer. We just stopped right there. And even while we were at the dinner table, we began a season of intercessory prayer for Don and Janice. Both of us prayed and asked God to, to work in their hearts and through the Holy Spirit um, to, to somehow reignite that uh, that flame that had started and, and renew that relationship and, and uh, give us an opportunity to uh, connect with them. And when we finished praying there at the table that night, I mean, no sooner that we finished praying, uh, Pastor Jan, uh, tell us what happened. Um, the phone rang and pastor phil um answered the phone and it was janice and she asked to talk to me and so i picked up the phone and she asked me to read um the baptismal um vows and you know we hadn't um we hadn't studied you know, the topics that we've studied with you. So I left out two of the most controversial ones that we hadn't talked about because I wasn't going to, you know, overwhelm her. And um, and um, she, she thanked me and I invited them over for Thanksgiving dinner. They accepted they came over thanksgiving stayed till almost midnight um we came to church the following sabbath and, and it just just kind of hit the button the the pause button there for a, a minute dear uh and 
let me uh, interject. I mean, we had been in the stage of intercessory prayer there at the, at the dinner table that night, that Sunday night before Thanksgiving. And I mean, after that conversation finished, uh, both of us were just unbelievable. I mean, we were in an attitude of praise to God. Lord, thank you for answering this prayer. I mean, it was unbelievable what had happened. And as Pastor Jan said, uh, we invited them over uh, that coming Thursday for Thanksgiving dinner. And they came, as she said, they stayed until midnight. That Sabbath, uh, they came to church again. And I had a baptism that Sabbath. And Pastor Jan, uh, uh, tell, uh, tell them what uh, Janice did after the baptism. After the baptism, Janice came up to me and she says, I want to be baptized. And I said, okay. I said, let's study together. And I didn't realize it at the time, but she was really ticked off. She thought, well, I know what the Bible teaches. I'm not worried about that. And um, so, but she agreed to do it. And so we started studying. And her husband, you know, d didn't want to join any organized church. And so he wasn't part of the Bible study. And, but he would ask her every night when she came home, what'd you study tonight? And um, in the meantime, um, what was he doing, Phil? Well, in the meantime, uh, I had, uh, in, in early December of that year, uh, I had announced to the church that we needed to make some serious uh, repairs uh, to our church facility. Um, that little church in Rock Springs, Wyoming, was erected as a temporary structure in 1939 for a series of, of Bible prophecy meetings that were coming to town uh, that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was holding there. And it was just to be a temporary structure, but um, here it was all these years later in the 1980s, and they were still meeting there, and they had done a few little things to make improvements and whatnot, but um, it was in need of serious, serious repair, and I was telling the church that we needed to do that. Well, after the worship service, Don came up to me, and he says, you know, he says, uh, I'm an electrician, and he says, uh, when I get off of work, he said, if you'll give me a key, he says, when I get off of work, um, I'll come by one night this week and I'll, I'll assess what the electrical situation is in this church and what, night, what might need to happen. So I gave him a key. I, you know, I figured I could trust him. And so uh, Don uh, came to the church uh, by himself um, and I didn't know when he was going to be there. What I did not know is that Don began to assess the electrical challenges in that church. Now, I told you it was a temporary structure built in 1939. And there, were, there was old knob and tube wiring. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. But there were many things in there that were an electrical hazard that could have uh, totally destroyed our facility. I mean, it could have gone up in flames. And Don discovered all of that. And Don, over the next several weeks, single-handedly, he did not even tell me that he was doing this, but he single-handedly rewired the entire church. Now, it wasn't a big structure. Uh, but he single-handedly rewired the entire church facility. And he later told me when I tried to, to, to pay him for it, he says, oh, no. He says, it was really interesting. He says, um, every time that I had to go buy supplies from the hardware store, he says, everything I needed was on sale. And he says, um, I really didn't shell out all that much money. He says, um, wow, he says, it was just amazing what God did. He says, I was able to rewire the church and, you know, it, it was phenomenal what he was able to do, but the church was sound electrically. And um, he made an investment in that little church, but yet he made it abundantly clear to us that he would never, ever become a member of that church. I will never join another organized church again. Uh, he had, had just a, a bad taste in his mouth. He said, I'm willing to fellowship with you. He knew that Janice was taking these Bible studies. And uh, now here it is, uh, moving on towards the end of January of 1985. And uh, Jan is continuing her Bible studies with Janice. And uh, what did uh, what what happened, Jan, as you were studying with with, with uh, Janice? What decision did she make? Well, she, you know, we were we were coming close to to the decision for baptism, and um, you know, I asked her to think about when she wanted to be baptized. And at the same time, um, you felt convicted to give an invitation to Don to be baptized with her, right? I went uh, uh, a Sabbath there, the end of, um, of uh, January. I felt deeply convicted to approach uh, Don and talk to him about this. And so 
Um, I, I, after church, I said, Don, I need to talk to you. And I took him in a back room and I said, Don, I, I know what you've said about never wanting to become part of organized religion. But I said, I think you know that your wife, Janice, uh, is soon to be baptized. She's planning her baptism right now with Jan. And I said, um, it, it's a real shame that you're not going to become a part of that experience with her. I, I feel deeply convicted to invite you to make that decision, Don, uh, to, to completely give your life to Christ and to become a part of that experience and be, be baptized. And I said, will you pray about it and, and let me know in the next few days? And uh, I think it was the next day he called me up that next night and he says, how soon can we start Bible studies? And so here it was now, early February, and we began Bible studies. And we studied, you know, like two, three nights a week, um, every night a different uh, subject. And uh, he, he challenged me. He would say, you know, I don't believe this, that, that you guys say the Bible teaches thus and such. And he says, I don't believe it. And he says, I know uh, that you people teach that um, you shouldn't eat uh, what you consider to be unclean meat, and, uh, but I can prove that differently from you. I can prove to you that, um, uh, that, that when, uh, when people die, they go, they go straight to heaven or go to hell. Uh, and, and night after night, he would tell me, he says, I know, he says, but I'll study this stuff with you, but he says, I don't believe it. And, and he says, I'm going to prove you wrong. And so every night he would come to his study ready to, to prove me wrong. And I would say to him, uh, Don, uh, okay, uh, so I'm ready to hear your arguments tonight. And he says, you know what? He says, I don't have any. And I says, well, I thought you were going to prove me wrong. Well, he says, you know what? He says, I went back home and he says, I began to study on my own. It's interesting. He had himself, some of you may remember, he had an old Commodore 64 computer. And this was the early days of computer technology. And he had a, an old dial-up modem. And he was able to access some CompuServe uh, database in, uh, in some big city. And he did all kinds of research on this, as much as he could do over the computer in those days. And uh, every night he would come back and he'd say, you know what, I, I discovered you're absolutely right on this. And he says, I don't have any arguments. And night after night, he continued. And the end of March of 1985, Don and Janice were baptized and became a part of the Adventist Fellowship. And it was just such a beautiful, beautiful experience uh, to see them baptized together. Uh, but, um, you know, God continued to do amazing things through their life. This, uh, and, and we've maintained contact with Don and Janice through the years. They've continued to be friends, even though our, our paths have gone in different directions. And, uh, but this last Sabbath afternoon, had been, it had been quite some time since I had had a conversation, probably a couple of years or more, since I have talked with Don and Janice. And this last Sabbath, after we came home from church on our live stream, I got a call from Don and Janice, and they wanted to visit. And uh, we had a wonderful, amazing visit, two and a half hour visit, just recounting the miracles of God. And here's the amazing thing. After Don and Janice were baptized in 1985, uh, he got really restless because he felt uh, God calling him. He says, I don't think I'm supposed to be uh, uh, an electrician anymore. I think God is calling me to do something else. And um, I said, okay, uh, what do you think it is? Well, he says, I think God is calling me to go back to, to college uh, and to finish my college education and get a degree to be a pastor. And Don uh, accepted that calling, and he served the, the Lord for a number of years. He retired three years ago as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, and through his ministry, through his ministry, excuse me, there were many people that were brought to Christ. And I look back on that experience that took place early on in my ministry, and it was pivotal for us in terms of understanding the power of intercessory prayer and how God works and the miracle that he did in their lives and the change that uh, he made for them. And, um, you know, God is just is truly amazing um, at, 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 what he, at what he does and what he can do. And so I just want to challenge you tonight as we've taken a look at this study on uh, the struggles of the Christian life. Yeah, there are many things uh, that the devil tries to put on our way, but God is more powerful. And God can, can take the, the, the crummy things of life and make amazing things happen out of them, just like he did in this whole situation with Don and Janice. 
and, and think about uh, what has happened as a result of that decision made clear back in uh, the early 1980s, the mid 1980s, and uh, what God has done since then. So I just wanna challenge you with the power of that story. Um, actually, Pastor Jan has a, a footnote uh, to that story that has a Southern California connection um, that uh, I'll let her share and finish up with. Well, it's pretty amazing because Janice Witt and Don were a little reluctant to tell his mom, who was a Catholic, that they'd become Seventh-day Adventists. And so they'd kind of put off telling her. And one Sabbath morning, she called up and they were just getting ready to head out for church. And she says, oh, what are you guys doing today? And so Janice, you know, kind of took a deep breath and said, well, we're, gonna, we're going to church. We're going to the Seventh-day Adventist church. And um, her, her mom said, oh, she said, Seventh-day Adventists, those were the people that saved my life. And what had happened was years before, she had property up at Big Bear, um, near the Big Bear area. And she'd gone up there. She'd gone home, but her, her boyfriend had not brought her dog back. And he had left it up there. So she went back up to go get her dog. And it was snowing. And it, it got worse. And the snow was so deep that she kind of got in a place where she felt like she couldn't go anymore by car and so she she had her mom with her and she left her mom in the car with the car running and she went up and she got the dog but she caught disoriented coming back and um she she was really um uh, you know cold and um periodically she'd lay down in the snow and the dog would you know lick her face and you know, try to get her up and she'd get up and she'd walk a little bit more and, and then she'd lay down in the snow again and she'd started having hallucinations and, and um, I, again, you know, the dog got her up and she, she walked a little bit more and she laid down in the snow this time, you know, to die. And um, um, she heard, she heard this noise and um, there was a man um, blowing, blowing the, um, drive, um, clean and he spotted her and he went and got her and took her into the camp. Well, it was the Southern California, um, conference camp. Um, and the, 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 there was so much snow in the road that he couldn't, you know, they, they couldn't take her out. So they just kept her for several days until the roads got cleared and they could take her back out. And so it was the Se Seventh-day Adventist who saved her life and, um, you know, administered to her. And so she was, you know, she had no problem at all with Donna Janice becoming Seventh-day Adventist because she felt they were such wonderful people. Um, the footnote to the story is that her her mom, who was in the car, Don's grandmother, there was a, a, a leak in the um, carbon uh, carbon monoxide. I mean, there was, you know, there was in the exhaust system there was a leak, and her her uh, mom died of of carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, so that part was sad, but you know, her life was spared. And so she was just really, really grateful to Adventus. And very proud of her son uh, when he became a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And um, anyway, we share that story because God is just amazing. He has a way of, of taking stuff uh, that the devil uh, intends uh, to mess our lives up and to make good things come out of it. And um, uh, God is so good. Amen. God is good. Amen. Wow. Well, listen, folks, uh, we enjoyed having you tonight and, um, we're going to have a final prayer here. And, uh, then, uh, I have an announcement to make after the prayer. So pastor Jan, will you have a final prayer for us? Sure. 
Father in heaven, we want to just thank you so much that you have so many powerful and precious promises that we can claim. We know um, and we are not surprised when the devil puts obstacles in our ro road, but we also know that as we draw near to you and as we keep our eyes on you, that you will give us the strength that you've promised to work those things out for, for our good. Um, and so, Father, we're claiming those promises and we're trusting you and we're seeking that deeper walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.